The title of my sermon this morning, this is a continuation of the one we had the week before Thanksgiving, um, is Discipleship for Disciples. This is the second part, and this is about mercy. The scripture will be taken from Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56. What is mercy? As we think about mercy, Oxford Dictionary says that it is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. I think that that is close um, to a, a biblical mercy. Um, I would modify it a little bit, emphasizing it is withholding punishment or consequences that one deserves. When you are merciful, someone deserves the punishment or consequence. I, one time when it snowed when I was a young man, uh, I made a, an ice ball and threw it at my brother's head and it hit the window um, and broke the window at our house. My daddy was very serious about his castle. He came home from work and I, I knew not to let him discover a broken window. So I met him at the car and I said, Daddy, I have something to show you. And I think it scared the mess out of him. Um, when I showed him the broken window, I was expecting a punishment. And he said, oh, son, I, you, you worried me. The, a window is easy to repair. He said, thank you for telling me. That was, that was mercy. That was mercy. I was guilty. I had broken the window. And he withhold, withheld the punishment. That was rare, wasn't it, Kelly? But it was good. I'll take it. Now, I just wanted to give you a note because these terms are used interchangeably at times. Mercy and grace are different. Um, so as I said, mercy is withholding a punishment that is deserved, is earned. It is justice, and it, you are withholding the consequence, or the punishment is justice, and you are withholding it. Grace is is giving an undeserved gift, okay? And so which is, which is different. Uh, and so as we get into the book of Luke, we are beginning Jesus' journey to the cross. At this, from this point forward, we'll see the turning point in verse 51. Um, everything kind of focuses towards the cross from this point on in the book of Luke. Uh, and the unique thing about salvation offered through the cross is that it is mercy, it is paying the penalty and so that God withholds an earned penalty, an earned punishment, that is death, a death penalty for sin. And it is grace because it is given to the undeserving. Uh, it is salvation and righteousness are offered to those who cannot earn it, cannot merit it. So just making that technical point there as we get started. Uh, and, and what is very interesting biblically, and what is rather confusing to people that really don't have a, a biblical acumen, and they're standing on the outside kind of looking in, we talk about these terms, and it's confusing because all these things are in the nature of God, grace, mercy, and justice. Grace and mercy supplement God's justice. God is just. Nobody gets a free pass. Nobody... Every sin has to be paid for. Look at this verse all the way back to the beginning in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. And, and now this is special, special revelation. This is Moses who wrote the Pentateuch, or most of the Pentateuch at least, had an experience where he saw the presence of God. Most of us, this will not happen until we get to glory uh, and so he saw them, and this is what God was saying, revealing himself to Moses. The Lord passed in front of Moses. Moses was hidden in the cleft of the rock, calling out, Yahweh, the Lord, God of compassion and mercy. Some translations say grace and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. Now, mark this down, mark this scripture down, because today's world sometimes gives us the message that if you are loving, 
then you don't pay attention to anything wrong that anybody does, that you overlook any fault or any wrong, even if they're harming themselves. You know what? If you love them, you love them to harm themselves. I will tell you right now, that is not God's love. And if that's the way you need love to be, uh, you're not going to like what the Bible says. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I have lavished unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, I forgive rebellion, and I forgive sin. So far we like that, but I do not excuse the guilty. Okay? And that is, that is to a person that does not understand what the Bible says on the outside looking in, that looks like a contradiction, doesn't it? Somebody has to pay for every sin. We are in a jam as sinful people because we can't unsin. Nor can we be good enough for the rest of our life to wipe away. We don't unsin by being good from now on. So somebody has to pay for every, every sin. And God is merciful and graceful. He is merciful in offering uh, uh, uh Mercy is when you do not get the punishment you deserve. That is offered on the cross. Jesus takes that punishment, and he is graceful in offering salvation to those that don't deserve it. Okay, now, back to Luke. As we saw last time, Luke is a training union, the old training union on Sunday evening, uh, for the 12 disciples. They are learning what it is they believe. Now that they are followers of Christ, Luke takes us along. We've got, we, we are watching this kind of unfold and learning from it. Uh, we are, there are three themes in this section, this discipleship for the disciples. We saw humility last time. This week we will look at mercy and probably about the first of the year we'll look at the cost of discipleship. Um, as I say, we're focusing on mercy today. Just reviewing right quick on humility. Uh, the first part of humility was dealt with individual pride how prideful we are, how we make other things. Not only do we make other things priorities over God, we become very proud of our priorities, whatever they may be. And Jesus, the disciples were bragging about all they had done in Jesus' name. If you remember in chapter 8, um, or at the beginning of chapter 9, they had gone out and they had healed the sick, they had cast out demons, and they were, they were proud about it. I mean, it would be a pretty amazing thing to cast a demon out. Uh, but rather than waiting for their reward in glory, they wanted some attention now. I think, I think our world is addicted to attention now. And Jesus rocked them. He said, whoever is the least among you is the greatest. He flipped their reality on its head. And the truth that he gives us is that we cannot set our sights on the fruits of this world, the things we can accomplish here and now, the things we crave here and now, and have spiritual true fruit also. Be productive in a spiritual way. These are some of the things, the fruit of this world, winning, um, being first at things, being first in line, being the first to know things, being the first with you know, the new technology or, or whatever, uh, always being liked. I think this has been, a, <laughs> I think this is a pretty timeless one, wanting to be liked, this desire for people to approve of us and like us. Uh, we, the fruit of this world is never making mistakes, um, never doing anything wrong. Uh, and if that doesn't work, never getting caught doing wrong, never, maybe Shading some, uh, cheating a little bit or doing a little shading, uh, but not getting caught for it. Uh, being trendy, doing things that are, that are, uh, everybody else is doing. And, and Jesus just said, you can't make those things the top priority and do God's business too. Now, these are not necessarily, as we always say, these are not necessarily great evil things. Uh, it is just that Jesus, if you are a believer, if you are born again, if you have accepted Christ into your heart, Jesus and his kingdom must be your priority. But Jesus put it very succinctly, uh, such a good passage in Matthew 
chapter 6, verses 31 through 30. Jesus said, don't worry, saying, what will I eat or what will I drink or, or what will we wear? For unbelievers, it says Gentiles, unbelievers seek all these things eagerly. That's what they live their life. They're focused. That's what, when they get up in the morning, they're seeking these immediate needs. And your heavenly Father knows you need them. So, so God knows we need to have a nice place to live and we need to have a car and we need to have clothes and, and all those things and uh, that we have a desire to be like. But, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let that be your consuming passion. Let that be the under, what underlies all your motivations and all your passions and all these other things will be provided to you. In other words, if you put God first, you'll get all the popularity you need. God will get you what you need, maybe rather than what you desire. Thus, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So that, for individual pride, see God first. Well, they also talked about group pride, and, you know, that would be, thinking that the way that your spiritual group does things is the best way and that people who do things differently uh, don't have a place at the table. And, that, and we are part of a worldwide church. Uh, the way we, we, we like Pleasant View, but we need to always remember that, that Pleasant View is just one instrument in Jesus' hand and we're united with a worldwide effort. Speaking of Lottie Moon Mission Offering, that's why we, we have that every year, so that we are contributing to the Invisible Church, the Worldwide Church, as a part of our Pleasant View work for Jesus. So that leads us up to our lessons in mercy today. So they meet opposition from Samaritans. They are in Galilee, and they are beginning to head south to Jerusalem for Passover. As the time drew near for Jesus to ascend to heaven. Of course, this is Luke later reflecting back on this time. Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Jesus, I don't, we don't know what Jesus knew. You know, we get a lot, uh, he knew a lot more than we do, but he didn't know everything. Very likely, uh, both by the, the clues that we could pick up, the, the politics of life, but also by his interaction with, the, with his heavenly father, with God the Father, he had some suspicion that he probably wouldn't come back to Galilee after this trip. Um, and so he was resolute. Now, if you went about the business of the Father um, Monday morning, but you knew that likely sometime on Monday you would be arrested and executed for, for your faith, you might stay home. We are to be like Christ. Now, I'm, I don't want anybody to be arrested and executed for Christ. And, and I hope that that doesn't happen anytime soon. One day it's going to happen um, that if we believe the Bible. Um, and we, we pray that that day is, is far in the future, which is, which is an irony. We pray for God's kingdom to come, but we also pray that you know, we have time, but we need to, we need to cling to this word resolutely, whether it endangers us or not. We need to be resolute about our business as Christians. He sent messengers ahead. He sent some of the disciples ahead to a Samaritan village that they would go through to make plans uh, for his arrival, to prepare for his arrival. As I said earlier, verse 51 is a pivot in Luke. Before this, Luke was talking about Jesus' ministry where he, where he would cast out demons, he would heal the sick, he would preach in the synagogue. From now on, we are headed to the cross, from this point on. And the cross is Jesus' mission of mercy for the world. Followers must be ready to follow as Jesus goes to the cross. And that's kind of our theme here uh, for the next several weeks as we go through this. So the disciples went, 
went forward to that Samaritan village, went ahead of Jesus, and probably they were complaining, maybe under their breath, grumbling, like, here we go again, guys. You, we know how Samaritans are going to act. We know Samaritans. Um, and, and yet we have to go. It's going to be embarrassing. Maybe. I don't know. This is speculation. This is speculation. It, in this place, it does not say that they complain. And they were right. There was no welcome for Jesus there. But the people of the village, the Samaritans, did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. I've, I've, I've said before, but the Samaritans are, are not Israelite people uh, racially. They are not related uh, by blood to the Israelites. In 722 BC, so about seven, over 700 years before this time, 750 years, the 10 northern tribes of, of Israel that made the nation of Israel had been taken into captivity by Assyria. And they had translocated the entire population and put them somewhere else in the Assyrian Empire. And they had gotten other people that they had conquered from somewhere else and they translocated them and put them in northern Israel. Now, people in the ancient world tended to worship local gods. So when these people from wherever they came from to the east, probably to the northeast, on the other side of Mesopotamia, when they came to the land of Canaan, they said, well, who is the deity here? And they said, well, it's Yahweh. And so they began to worship Yahweh, but they kind of integrated into that worship the way they worshiped back home. So it was a hybrid of biblical faith uh, that, the, that the Israelites practiced. And so that, to an Israelite, that is the worst thing you could do. Um, and so there was a lot of bad blood. The, the Samaritans were waiting for a Messiah also. Um, they did have a good portion of the scripture, the Old Testament. But they did not think that Jesus was him. So if the disciples had been complaining, they would have been correct. The Samaritans were very religious people, yet they were ignorant of the truth. The Messiah has come. And so they re rejected Jesus, and they refused to allow him to stop there. Now, I, now we all, most of us here grew up in Burke County, and, and we interacted with um, people that had grown up in church. And, and those are hard people, people that are religious, people that had grown up in church are challenging to witness to. You know, at some point, a lot of these people have stopped going to church now. But it was always challenging because if you've grown up hearing, um, you have to take responsibility for your sin. You have to believe that Jesus is the only way to God and you have to commit your life to him. And you've never really done it or you... You sort of half did it uh, because there was some peer pressure on you, but you didn't really take it as heart knowledge, as a deep commitment. Um, maybe you got, maybe even got baptized. We've talked about this in the past. Then you go try to talk to a person because obviously they are not living for Jesus. That's tough. It's a tough interaction because they know everything you're going to say. They've heard it all, but they're hard to it. That's kind of the situation we see here uh, with the Samaritans. Now, it kind of doesn't matter if it's difficult or not. I'm not letting anybody off the hook. I'm just recognizing that it is difficult. Sharing Jesus in the way we act and what we say is your absolute duty. If you are born again, if you are a believer, that is your job every day. There's no days off from it. That's your job every day. But I wonder, as I was thinking about this, this conundrum here we see, is that really the case anymore in Burke County? Are there a lot of people who now who grew up in church and have heard it all and they're not living with the Lord? I think it's changing. I mean, I, I think, I think with the way the world is changing, there is opportunity for us. There is opportunity for us. And I believe that people can look around Burke County, and certainly on the news and on the internet, and they can see the alternative to a world or, or to a, a, a culture with Jesus somewhere 
towards the center. I don't want to say that Jesus has ever been in the center of our culture, but, but, but that he is appreciated and recognized. They can see the alternative. We can look around and we can see, we can see godless behavior. And so I think there's an opportunity. That's what jumped out at me. I want you to think about that. The people that you interact with this week, there's a new opportunity there. Nobody, nobody loves the chaos. Nobody loves the godless chaos in the world. So pride over mercy we see here. How do you think the disciples, and don't you love the disciples? I mean, they, they don't get it. They don't get it. They'll get it later, but they don't get it, do they? How do you think they react to this rejection by the Samaritans? Do they think, you know what, we need to, Jesus, could we circle up and pray for the Samaritans? I wonder if there's something kind we can do to them that, you know, maybe might open the door. Do you think they're going to do that? And when the disciples, James and John, saw the rejection, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and burn up the Samaritan village? Just like Elijah did. Is that what you want, Jesus? The disciples, with, with true and righteous indignation, asked if they should call down fire on all of Samaria. Now, there is background to this. Probably, very much, they are referring to Elijah who called down fire in 2 Kings 1. Elijah was going, he was in Samaria, he was going to the capital of Samaria, uh, and he was stopped by some, some of the king's troops who were going to arrest him and probably do him harm. And he called down a fireball on them. Um, so he had done that. Plus, if you remember, at the end of chapter 8, they were at the transfiguration where Jesus uh, was there with Moses and Elijah. And of course, they thought, wouldn't that be cool? You know, thinking back to all the wonderful spiritual things Elijah did, they said, wouldn't it be cool to fireball somebody? Um, it makes you shake your head. You, you have to scratch your head sometimes. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is good to us, I think, to include the disciples because some of the nonsense that we come up with doesn't look so bad, does it? So calling down fire is not a spiritual gift. You will not see that on any list. Do not hope for that. Do not, do not practice, you know, God... Whatever, I don't know how you, how we, what you would do there. And so Jesus, of course, turned and rebuked them. Um, we could talk about Elijah for a long time and, and what was going on there. God had a purpose in that. Uh, we are no longer in situations uh, where we need to be bring God's justice on people. That's coming. We are, now our job is not justice on this world. Our job is mercy, a mercy that will call them to the cross. Uh, the only mercy left for much of this world is the cross. So they went on to another village. Jesus had mercy on this village. Jesus did not call down a legion of angels to wipe out this village. Jesus did not rebuke the Samaritans as he did the fig tree and cause them to be wiped out. Jesus had mercy. Uh, Jesus rather re rebuked his followers who did not want to have mercy. There's a lot of people in this world I would like to not have mercy on. There are a lot of groups of people. I've told you, I've confessed. I find myself wanting, desperately wanting vengeance. And then I say, it's, it, it, the Bible is very clear. We don't know the hearts of people. We don't know the reasons why people do anything they do. And so vengeance is not for us. We are to have mercy. Now, that, now be careful there. Mercy as it relates to the cross. Mercy is not saying whatever anybody does is okay. That's something else. Make that difference in your mind. Mercy is your only hope is the cross. Jesus first revealed himself as Messiah to the Samaritan woman. 
So Jesus was not a Samaritan hater. He made the good Samaritan a hero in one of his stories. Luke, in writing about Jesus, emphasized how Jesus loved the outcast, the women, the sick, the lepers, the children, the demon-possessed, and the religious ignorant, those who were religious yet were ignorant of the truth. Jesus welcomed all, but told them the truth in love. That's the key there to the mercy, to the mercy we're talking about. The gospel is for everyone. And if you are sitting on it, if you are hiding it, if you are covering it up, if you are steering the conversation away from the gospel, you are not having mercy on people. This world is a desert. Have you walked in the desert? The desert is beautiful. Beautiful. There is a subtle beauty to the desert. I am a fan, having lived in the desert, I am a fan of the desert. But I'll tell you what, you get thirsty quick in the desert. And if you do not drink, you die in the desert. This world is a spiritual desert, and you are carrying a drink of water in your hand. And if you are ashamed of it, you are murdering people. The gospel is for everyone. Spiritually murdering people. 2 Corinthians 1, chapter 3 and 4, Paul wrote, God is our merciful Father and source of all comfort. So inherent in the nature of God, the Creator. We were created in His image. He is the source of all comfort and He is merciful. He comforts us in all our troubles so that why? So that we can comfort those that do not know him. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. And that is salvation. Earlier in Luke chapter 6, verse 36, he said, Therefore, be merciful. Just This was in the, his, the Luke Sermon on the Mount. Be merciful just as your Father is also merciful. How do we relate to sinful people? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Don't fool yourselves, people. Those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or steal or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheaters, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. If they make that their identity, their spiritual identity is whatever their sin behavior is and not make their identity in Christ, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And here's the clincher. You were once like that. There's not, we, need to, we need to not look down our nose at anyone. It is not ours to bring justice. But you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. You were a recipient of God's mercy. Because you were just like everybody else before that. Jesus' mission was mercy on the cross. For you and me, our greatest mercy, as I've said today, is to tell the truth about the cross. Let us pray. Lord, help us to tell the truth in love. Lord, help it to be a true love a merciful and faithful love like you have for us. Help us to love our world and help us to tell the truth that you came to save. And rather than a fireball, which maybe we have earned, you give us eternal life. You offer us eternal life. Lord, we thank you for that. Help us to be your disciples. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.